Welcome to the video 27 in the Foundations of Computational Economics course. Uh, with this video we are starting the second half of the course, which will uh, deal a lot with uh, dynamic models in economics. And therefore we have to start right away with the most important tool, uh, which is dynamic programming. Well, uh, today we will talk about the discrete models, uh, um, which is the easiest, the easiest way to start. Uh, so what is dynamic programming? Uh, according to the definition in New Palgrave Dictionary of Economics, it is a recursive method for solving sequential decision problems. Uh, but in computer science, dynamic programming is known as a general technique of writing algorithms, uh, which can break uh, the big problem that is hard to solve into small subproblems, uh, assuming that this, the, the problem at hand has this overlapping uh, uh, subproblem structure. Uh, and this technique is very powerful. Uh, sometimes it allows to uh, solve uh, the, the, the problem uh, in polynomial time ex instead, of, instead of exponential time. So it is very, very useful and certainly useful for, for a whole lot of uh, dynamic models in, in economics. Let's start with a simple example. So in this example, we are learning how a big problem can be broken into uh, small subproblems that can be solved relatively easily. So consider the whole the, the following question. Uh, imagine that you have uh, a board, uh, three squares by you know a large number of squares, n squares. So so, so we have a three by n board, and uh, we have tiles. Tiles are like domino tiles, two by one uh, squares. The question is. Uh, how many ways is there to fill uh, a given board with this two by one uh, dominoes? So here are some examples. If we have a three by two uh, board, then there are three ways to tile them uh, with 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 the with the uh, with the given tiles, and they're shown here, right? Um, but if the board is larger, so 3 by, say, 8 over here, then this is one example of how it can be tiled. But, uh, but there can be a lot more examples, as you can, as you can imagine, uh, or a lot more uh, ways, not just this one. So how many ways, and how do we even count, count these ways? How can we compute how many times, or how many different ways is that to to tile uh, a board of, uh, of, of any length n. Um, so uh, here's an approach. Let's think of this problem recursively. So imagine that at some stage we have uh, tiled uh, you know, a part of the board and let's think about which states, which, which states we can have when we solve the problem partially. Well, apparently, uh, there can be uh, these three situations. We could have a complete rectangle tiled, we could have the corner on the top empty, or we can have the corner at the bottom empty. Okay? Now, these two cases are not possible. And uh, it takes an additional couple of arguments to prove that this is the case. Uh, and you can think of this first case, for example. So if there's if there's a square sticking in the middle, that must be a tile here, right? But that means, so uh, a tile here. But that means that there must be a tile here because there is a square now or a tile here. And by the way, we're now talking about this case as well. So the, the proof includes both, both of this. And you can see that by induction, we can show that, you know, we will get to the point when there must be only one uh, square. Uh, uh, that needs to be tiled, but this is impossible because the, the, we're tiling with two by one uh, rectangles. So uh, a simple proof shows that these cases are impossible. Okay, now let's say that a n is the number of ways to tile a rectangle, b n is the number of ways to tile this shape, and c n is, uh, is, is the uh, a number of ways to tile this shape, where n every time refers to the length of of the tiled region. All right, uh, we need to find a recursion. Dynamic programming is all about recursions. So how could we get to this tiled rectangle? 
Well, here are three ways that it would be possible. And as you can see, it involves the other shapes that we would use inside of this AN to, to, to tile it. And if there's AN ways to tile this full rectangle, that must be equal to the number of ways to tile a n minus two type rectangle, you know this 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 is one way, plus the number of ways to tile this, and then we can add uh, the completion and the number of ways to tile this, uh, and as you can see, we're getting to the recursion. Same thing works for the b n. There are two ways to get to 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 this shape, and the c n is going to be symmetric with uh, with b n. All in all, we can write the following, the following recursion uh, uh, expressions. So a n is the number of ways to tile the rectangle is uh, essentially the number of ways to tile the rectangle which is shorter uh, plus two times the number of uh, ways to tile this b shape. Right. This uh, this this basically gives all the ways to tile the rectangle, and similar recursive expression for B n. Okay. It takes a very simple code to calculate these uh, two recursive sequences. Uh, uh, we will store the uh, calculated values in two lists uh, A and B, and we just need to initialize the sequences correctly. Uh, Let's say that there is one way to tile an empty board. It's already tiled. Uh, no way to tile the three by one board. So a of one, the rectangle three of uh, a, a three by one board. And similarly, there's no way to have a zero length board without a corner. Uh, and there is a single way to tile the th three by one board without a corner. It's just one tile, right? And then in lines nine and ten, we have the recursive uh, expressions. Okay, let's uh, just run this code for for several different ends. You can see that there is a zero way to tile a three by one board, as you would expect. Uh, three ways to tile the three by two board. This is what we saw in the beginning uh, as the examples. Zero ways to tile a three by three board. You can try it yourself, but here's the uh, the answer. And in fact, it's there is no way to tile the board of the uh, odd length at all. But there are different ways to tile the the board with uh, uh, even length, and you can see that this number grows fairly fast. Now, uh, you know, three by eighteen board is not such a big board. Uh, it would be quite hard, though, to enumerate, uh, uh, you know, a hundred and ten thousand uh, different ways to tile it. And here, with a very simple recursion, we can solve this, uh, you know, we can calculate this number really, really fast and efficient. This is the power of dynamic programming, or breaking the big, uh, breaking the big uh, problem into uh, a sub, you know, a series of overlapping small problems. Okay, let's look at a different example now, uh, which involves choice, because dynamic programming in economics uh, is very rarely done without an optimal choice. So this is, uh, this is uh, a model that is inspired by Deal or No Deal uh, TV show. And I don't know how many of you know about this. Uh, uh, you know, I think it's still airing in some parts of the world. Uh, but the deal is that um, the player is presented with N boxes with known prizes. But it's, uh, this is unknown wh which box contains which prize. Uh, at each round of the game, the player may choose a box at random to be removed from the game. And the prize is revealed uh, in the removed box so that uh, the, the player always know the, uh, knows the remaining prizes. Uh, but at any round as well, the player may choose to stop the game and walk away with the prize randomly chosen from the remaining boxes. Now, uh, usually in the TV show, the one box is at random is given to the player or, or there's an initial choice. So, so it's like the, the player has one box set aside already, but this is equivalent actually. So you can stop and choose a random box from the remaining ones. What is the optimal strategy to maximize the expected reward? We have to talk about the expected here, right? Because there is this randomization, which is uniform all the time, but uh, uh, the boxes are chosen uh, the boxes are identical, so there is nothing the player can condition on when choosing them, so it's, it's basically chosen uniformly every time. 
Uh, we need to think about what uh, the player wants to maximize. So if it is expected uh, reward, then uh, imagine what rewards would be given to, uh, or could be won at uh, any round of the game. So let's think where the round when there are three boxes, X, X, Y, and Z. The expected reward from stopping the game is just the average over the three, three values, right? The box, the prize box is given or chosen at random and the expected value that the player gets is the, just this average. Now, if the game is not uh, stopped and instead continued, then on the next uh, round there will be two prizes, either X and Y, X and Z, and Y and Z, and, uh, because one of them will be removed. Uh, of course, then the expected reward from the continuation uh, in each of these cases is given by the average between the remaining prizes. And because we are removing it at, at random as well, then there is a one-third uh, probability of going into e each of these three uh, scenarios. Well, you can stare at this expression really hard and see that it's actually equal to this one. And so that means that the player who is just maximizing the expected reward should be indifferent between stopping the game or continuing the game at any round of the game, at least in the way we set it up. Uh, well, in the real TV show, then there is there are other elements, like there are calls and deals which are offered to the player to stop the game uh, and take the deal and things like that, right? So uh, there are complications in the real life that we will not be looking at right now. What should we, uh, uh, you know, but let's try to make this, this problem interesting. And here's the way that we can make it interesting. Um, let's think that... The player has a uh, 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 more complicated utility function. Uh, in particular, it has loss aversion utility function. So what's, what's that? Uh, instead of just looking at the expected reward, the player uh, compares this reward with some reference level. Okay? So there are two parameters in this utility function, two arguments. The reward itself and also the reference. And if it happens that the reward is less than a reference, is below the reference, something that you expect, then, then you get a hit in the utility, right? So if you thought that you would get a big price, but you instead got a small price, uh, then th this, this brings less uh, utility than, than, uh, than the price itself. And um, where does this reference level come from? Well, let's assume that uh, the reference is updated and it is set to, in each round, it is set to the foregone option of stopping the game in the previous round. So it's like when you decide to continue the game, you're hoping to at least get what you could have gotten by stopping the game at each round. Okay, that's that, this is the setup. Um, so the questions that we need to think about before starting to write the code is, you know, what is the maximum number of rounds in this game? What does the optimal choice depend on in each round? The optimal choice to stop or to continue the game. And what is the complete strategy? Let me give you some seconds to think about that. All right. Um, let's see. Um, first question. What is the maximum number of rounds? Well, there is a finite number of boxes, right? And each round get rates of the box, so the no maximum number of rounds just equals the number of boxes. What does the optimal choice depend on? Well, we'll see it in a second. But what is the complete strategy of the game? So what is the strategy in general? It's like a rule book, right? It's, it's, it's the list of optimal actions in all possible states of the game. So the strategy, and this is what we need to calculate, is essentially something that tells the player what to do in every possible situation. What are the possible situations? Well, different collection uh, of boxes, or different sets of boxes which uh, still remain, but also don't forget about the reference utility. That's also uh, uh, something that the optimal choice should depend on. All right, so let's try to uh, formalize this, this game. Uh, let's see, maybe B can uh, denote the set of remaining boxes, and there are N of these boxes, so boxes or prices, but we don't know which box has which price. And let's assume that R is the reference level 
in the current round. I want to write the expected uh, maximum expected reward, assuming that the, uh, the player is playing the optimal strategy. So what's the most expect in expected terms that the player can get from, from this game? Well, uh, because this is the maximum, right? Then we will choose the better one out of two options. The options are to stop the game and to continue the game. What do we get if we stop the game? Well, as we were saying, that's just going to be the average of the utilities of the remaining boxes and, of course, conditioned on the current reference level. Um, I can denote that as uh, R uh, with sub R. This is reward conditional on the reference. But if the game is continued, then essentially we will have the value of the game, which has a, uh, the set of boxes less one, less the one that we've uh, decided to throw away. And this is, this is the notation for that, right? This is the set uh, difference. And the reference level will be updated to the one that we could have uh, gotten if we stopped the game. Okay, so the continuation value, the value to continue the game, is basically given by the average of, of the same functions that we are writing here, calculated at different arguments. So you can see the recursion right away, right? The, 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 uh, the, uh, the value, the maximum expected reward in each round can be calculated using the maximum expected reward in the future rounds. Can we code this recursion up? Well, let's try. And uh, we will just start writing this expected reward function. What are the arguments? The boxes is just going to be a list of prices that remain. There will be a reference level. And if it's none, then just let's take the average between all of the boxes. So I take the sum of the values in the boxes divided by the number of boxes cal calculated here. As you can see, I'm not using NumPy here, so box is just going to be a list. And then we have length uh, and so forth. Uh, and uh, th this, this uh, updating happens if reference is none, but otherwise it's just left at the given level. Um, what are the other arguments? Uh, a loss aversion parameter. Uh, we can change it and see what happens with the player. Uh, this parameter is essentially um, the parameter, the parameter uh, um, uh, uh, theta here. That's this parameter that I mean. And uh, we can print some things out uh, uh, and turn that off if needed. Okay, so the first step. Let's calculate the reward if we decide to stop the game. As you remember, this is the average of the utilities of the prices. So first I'm calculating the utilities of the prices, and this is going to be, uh, this is done with list comprehension, going through all the prices in all of the boxes, and for each I'm just calculating the utility, right? And as you, uh, as you remember, it's just the, the level B minus the loss aversion parameter if B happens to be less than the reference. And then we want to take the average, so that we sum these calculated values divided by the number of boxes. So current now holds the uh, the current reward that we want to compare to the continuation uh, expected reward. Now, the n equals 1 is a special case. So if there's only one box remaining, then uh, I'm going to set the next, uh, which is the reward of continuing the game, equal to the current. And over here, we return the maximum between these two values. So this is the maximum that uh, implements this maximum here. And this side, this is called current in the, in, in the code, and this side is going to be called next. Okay, so if there's only one box, then you're basically left with this, uh, uh, with this price, which is in this box, and the game stops by itself. If there are more than one boxes, then we will calculate the, the expected value of continuing the game in this variable next, and we initialize it at zero, and then we go through the range of n, so we go through all of the boxes, and add to this next value, what do we add? Well, the expected reward of a new set of boxes, and this is going to be a list composed of two parts, right? Whatever box is up to i, and i, as you remember, goes uh, through all of them, uh, together with the boxes which are starting from i plus 1 to the end. So we're taking, this is basically the list without the box indexed i. 
Now, the reference level is going to be set to the current. Uh, this is the current reward, and this is the updating of the reward that we talked about. A loss aversion parameter and verbose parameters are going to be just passed through to the, uh, to the nested uh, um, call of the same function. Okay, and once we've uh, calculated the sum, so we added to the next variable all of the variables here, then we can divide it by n. Remember this nice operator when you have an op the binary operation equals, that means that we take next, divide it by n, and uh, uh, give this, uh, the result of this operation back to next. So this is basically dividing next by n. Okay, so this is this completes the calculation of the uh, of the reward uh, expected reward if we continue the game, and then the in the end we just have to take the maximum of these two, right? Uh, this gives the maximum expected reward. That's what we wanted to calculate, and also wherever this maximum is reached, that gives the optimal action. Well, let's not output the optimal action. Let's just print it, and let's print more than that. So let's print all of the boxes which remain in this round. Uh, let's print the reference level in this round. And then uh, if we have more than one box, then we actually uh, calculate it or we print the rewards, the expected rewards if stopping or if continuing. And we also print the optimal action. And this is basically just uh, given by this expression here. Stop if current is greater or equal next. Otherwise, continue. This greater or equal is important in the sense that this is the tie-breaking rule here. If the rewards are equal, then we prefer to stop. Uh, it doesn't matter in terms of, of the amount of the reward, how the, the ties, are, ties are broken. Now, let's just do it this way. Okay, I've uh, ran this function and now we can try it. Oh, so I need to import math because I'm not using NumPy for some reason here. Uh, and uh, I want to create boxes to be integers, uh, but unequal. So here are the initial prices. The initial prices in the boxes, and we have three in here, are one, two, and seven. And here's the, uh, uh, we're calling the expected reward, our function. And here's the output. Now, you can see that this, this, this is a lot of output first, and then it starts with something which, which, which only has one box, right? We start with printing the boxes and the reference level. And why, why, is the, why does it come out this way? Well, that's because we're calling the nested function. Uh, uh, um, we're calling the same function before we do any prints. So even though the function starts with a complete set of boxes, we don't get to see uh, this printout uh, before it, uh, uh, it completely uh, comes out of the recursion. And so the start is really the last line here. What happens? Uh, we start with a set of uh, boxes and prices 1, 2, and 7. The reference level, we didn't give it here. So it's just the average between these numbers. And uh, the reward if stopped is just this. And this is, can be calculated directly. But what's the reward if we continue? Well, to do that, we need to look at different cases. And the cases are actually just, you know, three boxes. We could throw away one of those three. So there are three possibilities. The remaining boxes being one, two, one, seven, or two, seven. In case there are two, seven, then the reward of stopping is this one. Uh, you know, the reference comes from the foregone uh, uh, price from this first round. So this is the new reference. And then if stopping, this can be calculated directly. If continuing, we have to go into deeper uh, sort of third round possibilities. And the possibilities here are to be left with either two or seven. Uh, and that just gives a reward directly, right? There is no more choice. So we can calculate this over here. Uh, essentially take the average because of the uniform uh, distribution. And you can see that these two rewards are the same, so according to our tie-breaking rule, we stop. And same thing happens here. But look at the interesting case here, uh, where, you know, we hoped for, because there were seven, the large price in the boxes, we hoped that we might get it. But in this, in this branch, we actually don't get it. 
and uh, uh, you know we are the reference is 3.267 but the reward that we can get right now with this set of boxes is just 1.4 and so we actually decide to continue because uh, you know to minimize this uh, this loss aversion uh, or to reduce the loss aversion we are still hoping to get the better reward even though we didn't get the the best of them so this is an interesting uh, interesting uh, effect of using the the loss aversion uh, utility function here Okay, let's confirm that the, uh, um, you know, if we didn't use the loss aversion, and this is equivalent to setting the loss aversion parameter to zero, then we get, uh, 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 yeah, then we get the completely rational player who is com indifferent between continuing and stopping in every possible uh, round of this game. You can see that we're stopping again according to our tie-breaking rule. Okay. Now, of course, we can now run big, larger games as well. And um, uh, here, too, uh, you know, it sort of starts in the back and then goes into different possibilities. Uh, interesting uh, effect here is that, you know, we start with this five boxes. And when we get to the four boxes, second round, we continue, continue 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 here as well but stop in here so there is an optimal strategy to stop at the second round of this game when you only have four boxes or when when, when you only opened one box and well what, what is that box that see if you're lucky to get the smallest price out then in this particular game with this particular version parameter, it turns out to be optimal to stop right on the second uh, round and take a random draw from this four prices, four bigger prizes. Interesting. Um, now, you can see how we've broken the big problem of finding the strategy into smaller sub-problems. Because essentially what we do with this uh, recursion uh, 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 code, right? We are calling the same code for smaller and smaller problems. And essentially it's like we're starting to solve the problem from the situation where there's only one box left. And then when we look at both these two, then we uh, solve the problem for the two boxes left. Uh, like that, or 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 this two, or this two, and then once we solved all of the possibilities of two boxes left, like this, we can go uh, like this three, one, two, and three. We can go to the situation when there were three left, and solve that one. And so it's like we're going from from the back of the problem to the front of the problem, and collect the solution uh, for the bigger problem by combining the solutions of the smaller problems. And this is the essence of dynamic programming. Now, uh, also, it's important to mention here that what's the strategy? What's the answer in the uh, uh, for the problem? Well, you can see here that for every combination of boxes and every reference level, there is a recommendation. There is an optimal uh, optimal action. What to do? And uh, this is also important to understand. The strategy, the solution of this problem is really a mapping from all possible states of the game into the uh, all possible actions of, of this game. So for every possible state, the solution has to tell us what's the optimal thing to do. Finally, uh, I have to say that the way we've written the code here uh, with the recursive call to the same function is actually suboptimal. And you can see that by observing that, for example, this 54 box, it appears many times uh, in our solution. This is 54 with reference 36. Reference is also important, of course. But here, uh, here it's exactly the same situation as here. And that essentially corresponds to the situation where we are solving uh, 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 through the tree of possibilities, uh, whereas it could be done uh, more efficiently. Let me make a little picture here. So um, it is, it is if we start in this point with, uh, with all of the boxes, and then we look at the possibilities 
uh, of uh, having different sets of, uh, of boxes of the smaller size. And then we look at possibilities uh, stemming from each of these scenarios. And then, you know, for each end situation, we calculate the rewards and then combine these to calculate the rewards on the previous step. Well, instead, what we could do and what actually dynamic programming does is we could define all possible states here in the end of the tree and all possible states in the previous step and solve all of these first and then solve all of these first. And then, of course, if some of the uh, end situations, the sleeves, are identical, then we would combine them into one and only solve them once. Okay? And a lot of the times, this tree actually looks something like, like this, where we start somewhere and we may go into different situations in the first round. Oh, this is not very visible. Okay, and then in the, in the next round, the set of situations is the same. And, and maybe we can go, you know, into, into uh, this situation, something like that. And then it could be that in the next round, the set of situations is again the same. And then solving it using a fixed set of the states uh, and going, uh, you know, from the back all the way to the front, that's more efficient. You don't have to really consider the tree of possibilities. You can consider the set of possibilities in the last round, and then the set of possibilities in the previous round, and then a set of possibilities in the first round. This is how uh, it's done, uh, uh, dynamic programming done uh, uh, more, more often, or um, uh, This is the true dynamic programming uh, principle and algorithm. Okay, so um, uh, what we have just done uh, corresponds to uh, what uh, Richard Bellman, the, 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 the inventor of dynamic programming, called the principle of optimality. Uh, an optimal policy uh, has the property that whether the uh, whatever the initial states uh, and initial decisions are, the remaining decisions must constitute an optimal policy with regard to the state where it started. Okay, so it's like every time we're solving in the optimal way the subproblem that we're facing at this time, and then by combining the optimal solutions to the subproblem, we can solve uh, the 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 big problem, the whole problem itself. Uh, and so dynamic programming is really is really breaking uh, a big problem into sequence of small subproblems, um, and this 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 uh, division into the initial or current uh, decision and all of the future decisions that we already solved for is going to be essential for understanding how dynamic programming works. Uh, now the uh, process that I just described where we solve the end first and then move forward, this, this, this algorithm is called backwards induction. This is applicable to every uh, finite horizon problems where we can start with the situation uh, which is lost, like one box remaining, and then work our way back in the backwards induction manner into uh, the initial situation, initial state, uh, which then gives this decision, uh, the, the uh, solution for the whole problem itself. Now this Recursive way of modeling can be expressed with Bellman equation, what's called Bellman equation, and this is going to be the uh, the central uh, part of the uh, dynamic programming approach. Let's look at the uh, very uh, um, general form of the Bellman equation. So we have uh, what's called a value function. And this is the maximum attainable discounted expected utility or reward. And that's exactly what we were calculating in the deal or no deal example. That was the maximum uh, expected reward. Now this function is a function of state. So uh, the problem leaves on some uh, 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 space of states, so state space. 
which describe all possible situations, like all, all possible remaining sets of boxes and reference utility uh, that are important for the decision to be made. Now, the decision has to maximize the sum of the current payoff, which is also called instantaneous or uh, per period payoff, and the part that corresponds to the future uh, uh, future value. So this is discounted, uh, although discount factor can be uh, equal to one, uh, which was the case in the deal or no deal uh, example, right? And then the expected next uh, optimal, next maximum attainable value and this expectation is calculated conditional on where we are now on the state and what we decide to do on the decision. And uh, you, you can, you can uh, see how uh, this expectation was calculated uh, uh, in the deal and no deal example by just equally weighting all of the possibilities because of the random choice of the box to be thrown away. So it depends on the decision, and of course it depends on the state, because we had a particular set of boxes from which randomly we would choose one to delete. What's important here is, you know, here's the recursion. We have V here and V here. Uh, the value of the next state is what we need to calculate the value of the state uh, in this current around or period uh, in this dynamic process. Okay, so this is the general form of the Bellman equation, but we will uh, work with many different uh, um, versions of Bellman equation through, uh, through the rest of the course. And so, for example, in the deterministic case, uh, where uh, there are no uh, randomness, we don't need an expectation, right? So, uh, uh, in, the, in the first example with tiling, we didn't, there was nothing random. And so, we could just calculate, you know, the, uh, the value of the current or the answer in that case, the number of ways to tile a particular uh, board as the function, direct function of the uh, number of ways to tile the smaller board. And also, in the first example we looked at, there was no decisions. And so, maximum was, would also be gone. So, it would be just a recursive expression. Uh, right, so the very, the very uh, uh, simple uh, form of Bellman equation there. Now, in finite horizon, it's important to mention that the Bellman equation may lose the second term here. So, at the terminal period when time stops, uh, there is no future, right? So, there is no next period state or next state. And we only are left with the maximization of the current reward. The final period, the terminal period, uh, is characterized by the fact that there's only the current payoff that exists there. Oh, I have some typo here. Um, it is, uh, it is, uh, um, uh, it is um, often that, um, Uh, it is often uh, done technically by just saying that there is a, a, a v at t plus 1, which is just identically equal to 0. And that means that, you know, as we add it, uh, as we add it over here, if this is 0, that means that, right, then this, this completely is, uh, is gone. So that's a technical, uh, technical thing that can be done. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the power of dynamic programming. It is really a main tool in analyzing uh, dynamic models in micro and macroeconomics. Uh, it is very flexible. Uh, you know, the dynamic programming is applied to any problem which can be broken into uh, smaller subproblems, and therefore it's really uh, applicable in many, many different uh, um, fields. Um, and it can be it can be used in uh, under uncertainty. Can be used to study strategic interactions, uh, in, like in game theory, uh, market inter interactions, and so forth. And you know, a list of the applications is is really long. Uh, uh, dynamic models of labor supply, job search, human capital accumulation, health, uh, consumption savings. We will focus a lot on this. Uh, durable consumption, consumption of durable goods. 
uh, macro models of growth and heterogeneous age overlapping generations all of this are based on dynamic programming as a as their solution technique uh, um, that's why it's important and we're spending uh, you know half of the course roughly on this now it's kind of funny where the dynamic programming term came from uh, it's uh, uh, Bellman's sort of biography that describes this and you can read this quote uh, uh, for yourself when you go through the lecture notes but the uh, the thing is the, the you know the essence is the he, he was trying to come up with a name that would make everybody happy even people who didn't really like research and so uh, programming was uh, uh, was something that roughly explained what he was doing but dynamic was not only the uh, accurate description of the uh, of working with dynamic models but it's also a word which is very hard to imagine to be negative you know if something is dynamic it's always good it's positive positive. and so uh, richard bellman used dynamic programming as he says here uh, as an umbrella for all his activities right um to complete this video we will look at one more model and see how bellman equation is formulated and how we can solve it using dynamic programming and this model is uh, uh is inventory dynamic pro uh, uh, inventory dynamics problem so this this is a model in managing inventory so this is going to be a discrete time uh, finite horizon discrete time we we will keep throughout the course we will not do anything in continuous time finite horizon is uh, is something that we uh, 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 look at now but we will also look at the infinite horizon problems in the next video so uh, what 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 are the variables in this model uh, there is an inventory uh, and we call it an xt uh, we assume that this these goods are uh, discrete are measured in discrete units think of refrigerators so you're managing a big store warehouse uh, with uh, xt of refrigerators there is uh, demand in each time period i don't know each week for example uh, which uh, could be stochastic uh, and you uh, every so often have to make an order of new inventory so you have to order a truck uh, to bring some more fridges in um, the parameters, the fundamental parameters of the model include the profit per unit. We will not think about costs and, and prices here. It's just the profit. So if you are, if you have the unit available for sale and there's demand for sale for, for this unit, uh, then you get P in profits. There is a fixed cost of ordering any amount of new inventory. So this is like hiring a truck. It doesn't matter how many fridges you want this uh, truck to bring, there will be a cost of hiring the truck. And of course, there will be a, a per unit cost of storing the goods. And this can be heating, electricity, uh, you know, just space uh, um, that's described by R. Um, so the sales at any given period T are given by the minimum between the demand and the inventory and the stock. So it's either uh, uh, if there is no demand for the goods that you can't sell or you don't have the stock available. So, you know, ordering stock is costly in terms of fixed, uh, uh, fixed cost and the storing cost. But not having the stock at hand is also costly because then you're, you have uh, uh, foregone sales. Uh, the inventory in the next period, this is going to be an important equation here. So what is it? Let's understand. Uh, first term is what is uh, remaining after sales. Okay, so sales can be either x or d whichever is smaller and then x minus d uh, could go negative right if there is uh, more demand than what we had and so then the maximum between this uh, difference and zero that gives the the number of units remaining after uh, we've sold some of them and then qt is the new order so this is the uh, uh, stored we would say that after the sales we, we, we say that all sales happen in the beginning of the period uh, and then the uh, storage cost uh, is applied to this amount, the amount which is left plus the order. And this is also the amount that we will have in the beginning of the next period. So this is the stock at period T plus one. 
And the profits, of course, are then given by the profits times the sales minus the storage cost minus the fixed cost of ordering the, a new batch of goods. And this is how it can be uh, written. This one, uh, this is an indicator function, right? So it's either one or zero, depending on the condition inside of the curly brackets. Now, assuming that uh, um, QT is greater or equal to zero, so we can only order positive amounts, um, we can say that uh, this uh, sigma here denotes a set of all possible choices in all time periods, okay? And this is what, uh, what we call a policy or a strategy. That's what we call strategy just in the previous example. So this is the description of what to do in every time period. Um, if the demand is stochastic, then what we want to do is to maximize the expected discounted profits. The pi of t is the profit. This is the discount factor. Of course, the uh, you know if time is greater than one, we have to take the power of the discount factor, and we want to sum over all time periods. Again, there is a capital T here because we're looking at the finite horizon version. Uh, and the expectation is taken over the distribution of all of these demands in different uh, time periods. Uh, and this is, uh, this is the uh, general maximization problem that the firm is facing. But, um, you know, we can write it recursively as well by, you know, sort of taking one component here out and then writing this as, as the sum of two components, the current and the future choices. Uh, well, decisions are just the new orders, QT. Uh, we always have to think about what is important for the inventor decision at time uh, period T. So what is that that we need to take into account when making the optimal choice? These variables will constitute the state space of the problem. Uh, as we can see from the expressions, the uh, instantaneous profit uh, depends on both the current stock and the current demand. And so both of this have to be in the state space because they're both important for the optimal choice in every time period. And I've already talked about timing. Uh, okay, let's try to write the Bellman equation. Uh, the way to do it is just to take the gener general form that uh, we have uh, on previous slides and start filling out the, uh, uh, the filling out the 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 the, the, tech, the different parts different fields, right? So state space goes here. Uh, state space, as we've decided, uh, or as we've concluded, is the current stock and the current demand. Uh, what is the uh, uh, per period payoff? Well, that's just profit, and that's given here in the more extensive form. And then we have the plus, beta, the discount factor of the expected future uh, future value. So w where are we in the next time period? Well, we'll have xt plus one uh, goods stored and the new demand. This has to be taken with respect, uh, I'm sorry, conditional on the current state, which is x and d and the current action. This is the generic form of the, uh, of the Bellman equation. Now we can skip that conditioning because we assume that demand is idiosyncratic. So it does not depend on its previous value, on any of the previous values, in fact. So it's, it's like a random draw, independent random draw in every time period. So there is no conditioning here. We just take the expectation with respect to this d t plus one. And we remember that st and kt stand for particular things which depend on x and d uh, in q. x and d being the state and q being the, being the choice or decision. So that's what uh, says here about the uh, idiosyncratic demand. Now, um, because we don't have to condition uh, on the current state of choice, then the distribution of demand can be just plugged into uh, the Bellman equation instead of the expectation operator. And it might be a little bit easier uh, to, to have this instead of the expectation, which is kind of un, uh, not fully specified. Uh, uh, but because the whole problem is discrete and we've decided that we, these are fridges that we're talking about, then the expectation is of course just the sum 
right? So here we have to sum over all possible Ds, which is the demand in the next period, uh, and uh, multiply with probability of this demand uh, the value calculated conditional or on, the, on that demand. And that's all that we need to do to formulate the Bellman equation. Now, in, in this video, we will look only at the deterministic case. So d will be fixed and constant across time. This is just a number, okay? And if this is just a number, then we can simplify the Bellman equation uh, similar to the way that we've mentioned already. First of all, there's not going to be any expectation because d is known. But then second of all, because d is constant, that means that it, we don't really need to have it in the, uh, in the uh, uh, state space. Uh, we will condition on it, so it, it enters, but it enters as a parameter. So it enters in the same way as P and R enter, enter this problem, and C, right? And so uh, for the dynamic problem, it's now only the dynamics of the inventory that matter. Uh, uh, and we can rewrite the whole thing using, using this really easy, uh, uh, simple form of the, of the Bellman equation. And again, uh, just to repeat, we have instantaneous payoff all the way to here. And this is the, uh, uh, the money that we get from sales. The minimum is the sales, P is the price. Uh, this is the storing cost. This is what we have to store, uh, conditioning on ordering this QT. And this is the fixed cost of the new order. So if QT is greater than zero, then we have to pay the C cost, which is the fixed cost of hiring a truck. And then for the continuation, we have the uh, discounted value of having this much in the beginning of the next period. All right, let's uh, see how this is coded up uh, in, the, in, in Python. Uh, we will use NumPy this time, we'll do some plots. Um, and I like to write uh, these small classes to describe the fundamentals of the model. This is going to be the inventory model. Um, we, will, we will initialize this model with the values of parameters, and it's very convenient to write the, uh, the default values of the parameters here in the init uh, uh, um, uh, function. And then uh, we will store these parameters as uh, attributes of the object. So we have to do self dot with all of them. So this is just storing the parameters and same for demand. And then we will, uh, I also want to uh, uh, pre-calculate uh, some of the uh, useful uh, features or, or at other attributes of this, of this object. And these attributes will depend on parameters. And as I say here, it would be nice to actually recalculate them when these parameters change, but we don't do that. Uh, here, we'll just have to reinitialize the uh, class itself or the object from this class if we want to change, say, the number uh, um, of the maximum inventory. And uh, another thing here is that the maximum inventory uh, is just the upper bound on the state space. But because everything is discrete, then inventory will be described by numbers, natural numbers, right? Uh, one, two, three, including zero. Uh, zero, one, two, three, up to this uh, upper boundary. Uh, and uh, so the number of inventory levels is one uh, greater because zero is included. And then there is an upper bound, which is the maximum inventory. And finally, I want to create the grid of all possible values of the inventory. And this is done with A range from, from NumPy. Uh, we will create some representation. It's going to be string representation of the object, just to say what it is. And then here, it's uh, quite convenient also to code up this internal, uh, internal functions which correspond to the notation. So sales, for example, this is going to be a minimum between X and D, where X is uh, the current inventory and D is the demand. And uh, um, next, uh, X here is what we need to store. You can recognize the formula here. Uh, uh, probably. Uh, so this is the uh, th this is what what is left after sales. X is the inventory that we had before. This is written slightly differently than uh, than how it uh, says here, but it's uh, here, right? But it's the same thing. And then the profits is the uh, price times sales. 
minus the uh, storing cost times the, what we need to store, uh, minus the fixed cost of uh, making a, an order. Okay, so uh, I'll go back to the slides mode now. So this, this is the class that holds the uh, uh, model fundamentals, essentially. And so if we initialize uh, um, an object called model from this class, and we can print it, it will say, you know, according to how we uh, define the wrapper function. Um, and then uh, let's make an order of zero and calculate the profit. So imagine that in some period we are not ordering anything, uh, and that uh, would uh, uh, just be Q, right? And we can calculate max profits, uh, oh, I'm sorry, model profits, the profit uh, following this uh, uh, order Q. Let's see. Um, so, <clears throat> The way uh, the way this is written and all of these little functions, and this is very important actually, is that I'm using the NumPy functions to calculate all of these parts of the model. And that means that the broadcasting will work uh, for all of these little functions. This is gonna be important as we can see here. So for example, if I say Q, Q equals zero and run this, uh, the profit function can work with scalars, okay? So if I didn't order anything uh, as a scalar, but it can also be a whole list, a whole array of zeros. And uh, it means that um, I can solve for all uh, points in the state space. So what it says here is, uh, uh, I want to calculate the profits in all points of the state space which is model X, that's the whole grid. For the uh, demand, which is given by constant, uh, a scalar, and for uh, orders, the Q, which correspond one-to-one -to, -one to the points of the, of, the, uh, of the state space. So the way we've written this uh, model fundamentals in the class uh, supports vectorization, essentially. Uh, okay, so uh, this, is, uh, this is what it is. And let's now, um, uh, let's now uh, test a little bit more what I mean, uh, uh, what, I, what I was just talking about, this possibility for broadcasting. So um, I, want, I want the orders to be in a column vector, just to try, okay? Uh, the model is already initialized, so let's print current inventory. The inventory is saved as, a, uh, as an array of 11 numbers from 0 to 10. And this is a one-dimensional array, as you can see. Now, sales is the same thing uh, with demand. Demand, if I remember correctly, was, was four. Demand is four. Uh, and so uh, current sales are given by what we have uh, being a limiting factor or the demand being a limiting factor, okay? Uh, let's see, current orders we made this to be a column vector. So these are the orders from zero to 10. And uh, yeah, we're just using the same numbers, but they mean different things. So this zero to 10 are current orders. And therefore I want to put them in a column vector because look, look what happens now. Uh, the next period inventory is suddenly a matrix. Uh, what, what is this? Well, we have the current period inventory in the row and then the orders in the column and the way they are uh, combined together in the function that calculates the next period inventory, broadcasting takes place, the NumPy broadcasting. And now the next period inventory is, uh, uh, you know, these numbers correspond to all possible values of the current period inventory and all possible values of orders. So look at this, if we had zero now and we ordered zero, then next period we're gonna have zero, okay? If we have zero now, but ordered 10, the next period we're gonna have 10. Um, right? Um, let's, let's, let's go back a little bit. So next, next X.
how is this calculated? It's x minus the sales plus the order. Let's verify that. So for example, we had current, uh, oh yeah, yeah, that, that, that's actually right. So imagine that we had 10 currently, and then we ordered zero. What happens? In this point here, we will have six in the, the beginning of the next period. So we had 10 in, in this period, there was a sale of four, so there was demand for four, we sold four, and we didn't order anything. So in the next period, it's gonna be six. But if we start with zero and order 10, so because we had zero, we couldn't sell anything this period, uh, but next period we'll have the complete order. And therefore, this first column in the resulting uh, matrix of next period inventory is just uh, numbers from zero to 10. Uh, in the, if we had four, for example, in the beginning, and so that was would be fifth number, one, two, three, four, five, okay? And we ordered nothing, then we will have nothing in the next period. Why is that? Well, because there was a demand for four, and so this four that we had, we sold, and then depending on the uh, the the orders, then the, in the next period, we will have uh, we will have so many. So in fact, all of the numbers in this first half of this matrix are just columns of, of zeros to 10 because we've, we would have sold everything that we had in the, current, in the current period. And the same thing works for the profits. So here I'm calling the profit uh, for, uh, for, the, uh, for the same uh, uh, current inventory and the uh, demand and the orders. And this calculates the current profits for all of these combinations of the current inventory and, and the current order. Uh, now, I'm spending so much time on this right now because this is going to be quite important when we calculate the uh, Bellman equation. Uh, remember, in Bellman equation, we have to find... Uh, let's go in, uh, back and look at it. With the Bellman equation, we have to find the maximum over all possible orders of this expression here. And that needs to be done for xt, which could be any uh, level of the current inventory. So we could, uh, you know, loop over all possible values of the current inventory, xt, and then calculate this expression, maybe loop over or, you know, somehow calculate the max over all possible orders. Or we can, like what we will do, form a table, uh, a matrix, with x is going this way and q is going this way, and then we will just take the maximum along the zeroth axis, along, along this, this, uh, 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 this axis, right? Um, and that will produce a vector where for each current x, there will be a maximum that we need to compute here because we're taking the maximum over all possible queues. And this is, this is the principle that we will use quite a lot uh, um, when uh, coding up Bellman equations. And so, so these are the current profits calculated for this matrix. Uh, in other words, that's, that's just this part here, you know, without the plus uh, beta uh, V plus, plus discounted value function. Uh, but this is the principle. We will have this matrix with X going this way and Q going this way. And we will take the maximum along the first axis, index zero. All right, so let's uh, code up uh, this Bellman equation. Uh, remember, Bellman depends on the uh, uh, on the value function that feeds in as an argument um, over here. So we need to have these values already calculated. Uh, when we start uh, calculating the Bellman equation. That's the input, ar uh, that's the input argument, and m is going to be the model, uh, model object. And so this is the next period value function that we need as an input. Okay, uh, what do we do? Well, uh, what we just uh, practiced to do. Uh, we create the grid of all possible orders, and this is going to be a column vector. Then we compute the current period profits, uh, as the matrix over here. And then we need to add to uh, this matrix the uh, uh, values from this V naught vector. 
Okay, and to do that first, we will calculate the next period inventory so that we know uh, which values of this V0 to, to, to take, right, and put in correspondence to each value of the, of the X. Uh, uh, well, it needs to be the next period x. So um, there is also one complication. We need to take the minimum between this calculated values and the upper uh, boundary of the inventory, because it could be that under some combinations of uh, axes and q's, we may go above the upper boundary of the problem that we set for ourselves. This is a technical parameter, but we need to stay within the boundary and therefore this minimum here. And also it's important to say that because the values of the inventory are just you know, uh, uh, integer numbers from zero to n, then we can use these directly as indices. And so we're calculating this indices for the next period of value. Uh, and we're using this i uh, directly into this uh, uh, to index the, the v naught uh, 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 v naught vector representing the next period value. Okay, and with this then, we can uh, form the Bellman equation. So, to understand better what this i is, go back to the Bellman equation and see where we need to calculate, uh, where we need to take uh, the value function of, right? So we are calculating this value function in the next period uh, and we have to look at it at this expression, at the level of the next period inventory. And this is what we're calculating in this line here to get an i. But then, you know, because of the structure of the problem, we use it as an index directly. So we don't need to search for any a uh, particular value of v naught because the inventory is discrete. And so discrete problems are easier in that sense. Uh, we will see what needs to be done when we, once we go to the, uh, to the continuous state problems. Okay, so this is the expression for the Bellman equation. And remember, this is still a matrix because P was a matrix and uh, uh, NumPy has broadcasted this vector v uh, that we've constructed here. Oh no, I'm sorry, i is also a matrix. So when we said v naught of i, that created a matrix as well. And so this, this is a matrix. And now to calculate the, uh, uh, the new, uh, the resulting uh, value function you know, in the Bellman equation, we just take the a max along the zeroth axis. But we also can we can also calculate the arg max. That's basically the uh, uh, the point where the maximum is reached, and that's going to be our decision, the optimal decision of how much uh, um, inventory, new inventory to order. Uh, that completes the Bellman equation, and now we can start uh, well testing it and then solving the model. So uh, imagine that I've uh, started with the v, which is complete, which is just composed of zeros, and this is the uh, the value that I will feed into the Bellman equation. This is like solving the uh, capital period T, as we already mentioned. Well, the Bellman equation then will return the vector of of uh, utilities essentially, and uh, what are the optimal orders uh, in the capital T? Well, don't order anything because if you order, then you incur the fixed cost. Uh, um, uh, right to have the higher stock next period, but next period nothing exists anymore. So it's like the company is liquidated, uh, and therefore there's there it makes no sense to order anything in the terminal period. But then if as as we do it uh, in a little loop here, uh, you know we're saving the v which is calculated by, by the Bellman equation, and then we're feeding this v back into the Bellman equation on the next iteration. And you can see that at the next iteration, the values had changed and now it's uh, in the capital T minus one. It is optimal to order something, uh, especially if you have a little stock and demand is four, remember? It makes sense to order this, uh, this uh, four units of good to cover the demand in capital period T and earn something. In capital period T minus, in the period capital T minus two, which is calculated on the next iteration, uh, we can see that it's optimal to order uh, uh, twice the demand if you have little stock. And this apparently 
why don't you do, uh, you know, an order of four each time period? Well, remember about the fixed cost. So even though it is costly to store some units for two periods, it apparently is more costly to order, uh, uh, order two separate batches of goods. Okay, we're approaching the end of this, uh, of this long lecture, uh, and we can now run the backwards induction algorithm for many time periods. We start from uh, the period uh, capital T, and then we solve the Bellman equation uh, uh, for each time period and record the optimal choices and go backwards in time, uh, each time using the uh, T plus one value, calculated value as an input to the Bellman equation. And once we reach the first time period, we have solved the problem completely, and we have this full strategy of uh, prescribing what are the optimal, uh, uh, the optimal actions, the policy, uh, in each time period and in each possible uh, state space, a point of the state space. Uh, here's, here's the final code uh, for the backwards induction. Uh, I'm going to be, I, I, I'm going to um, initialize the value and policy as matrices where we will have uh, the, 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 the state space being in vertical in rows and, and each row is going to be corresponding I'm sorry, and each column is going to be corresponding to the uh, uh, particular time period. Um, yeah. Uh, and here's the main loop of the Bellman, uh, I'm sorry, of the backwards induction. It starts at capital T, it goes all the way to zero in steps of minus one. Uh, with uh, uh, to, to get us a uh, better understanding of what's happening, let's print the time period. And um, uh, so what's going on here, as you can see, is that we are calling the Bellman equation uh, in the periods which are not the capital T, not the capital period. In the capital period, we uh, already know that it's optimal not to order anything, so the policy will be just zeros. And uh, the value can be just cal calculated directly by computing the profits uh, in the capital period. Uh, because we know the optimal choice. The optimal choice is not to order anything, and uh, uh, um, that means that we can just simply plug it in and calculate the profits. And you can see here that we have, uh, we have uh, a, an index of, of this output policy and value matrices to be one less than the index of the time period. Okay, let's run this. Uh, this is a function and here we run it here and this is very visual of what's going on and what the uh, backwards induction really is. In time period 5, you know, we are printing here the, the value, this matrix for values, the value functions. In the last time period, we, are, we just filled out the last column of this matrix. This corresponds to, uh, this corresponds to the uh, capital, period, uh, capital T last period. And if you remember, this just corresponds to the utility levels. Then we go on the previous period and we calculate the values in this uh, previous period using the values in the last period. And we continue doing that all the way to fill out this matrix where we have state space uh, 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 um, on the vertical and time periods on the horizontal. And this, this gives us all of the values in all points of the state space and all time periods, okay? And now what are the optimal actions? They're here. Here's the optimal policy. This is how much we have to order in each of the points of the state space and each of the time periods. So it really gives us a complete strategy of the optimal behavior in this particular setup. We can also plot these this things now, here are our value functions in time in five different time periods, and uh, here are the optimal policies or optimal orders. Um, can we make sense of these value functions, economic sense? And this is very important to do every time you've solved a problem to really understand whether uh, uh, you know there are any bugs or anything like that. Uh, look, in the final uh, fifth time period, the value grows all the way up to uh, four, right? I guess the, the ticks could be done uh, a little bit better. So this one, two, three, four, uh, but then starts to decline. Why is that? 
Well, we know that demand is four. So if you have less than four units, uh, you can sell them. And uh, of course, the more you have, the more profits you get. But if you have more than four, then you also have to store the remaining unsold ones. And even though the company will be liquidated in the next period, there is some cost of storing the unsold units for this last period. And therefore it declines a little bit. And then interestingly, in the capital T minus one, there's this, and all other periods, there is a flat region. What happens there? So imagine that in capital T minus one, you have five units. Well, uh, it seems that you would sell, sell them all in one period and say capital T minus one, you sell four of them, one remains, and then you would uh, buy, you know, the other three or two or three so that uh, the next capital T period, you can, you can, you can uh, sell them all as well, right? And satisfy the demand. And so the value of having, you know, uh, um, four, five, uh, or six is the same because you can uh, you can buy an addition, an additional uh, small batch to satisfy the demand in the in the last period, and uh, the the optimal policy looks exactly like that. You have to buy in the in capital T minus one in the fourth period. You have to buy so many units as to satisfy the demand. Uh, of the capital uh, T period. And therefore, there's this flat spot in the uh, value function. So it seems that, uh, uh, it, seems that uh, it does make sense what we get out of this model. And then, of course, we can run it on, on a much larger scale and, and observe the, uh, uh, you know, with maximum inventory being 50 and the demand is uh, being 15. Uh, uh, you know, let's see what happens. Th these are the value functions and the uh, optimal policy, which is just the same for all the time periods except for the last one, it seems. Let's see what happens if ordering a track is suddenly a lot more costly. Look, uh, so I've, I've changed the C uh, parameter and we get a completely different, uh, completely different solution. Uh, look, the optimal policy is to order 15 if you have less than 15 and order nothing else. And this is just because the fixed cost of order uh, is prohibitively high in a sense, right? So there's no way there is any adjustment in the stepwise uh, fashion that is happening here. Or we can uh, go the other extreme and say that ordering is really cheap, uh, ordering a track. Then we get this flat spot of the value function being really uh, long because we can adjust to the fixed demand uh, and, you know, with all the steps in the optimal policy function. Very interesting. Okay, I'll stop here. Uh, the next steps in this model will be to code up the stochastic demand and to bring it to infinite horizon because, you know, liquidation after so many periods is probably not a very realistic, uh, very realistic modeling setup. Uh, we will look at the infinite horizon and, 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 and uh, uh, models and models with uh, discrete stochasticity in the next, new next several videos, but then we'll come back to this uh, inventory problem as well. Uh, there are some further learning resources. You can finally go to the Adam uh, uh, Russell book. Oh, uh, uh, Adam Cooper book. It's Russell Cooper uh, to read about these dynamic economic models. Um, and a little bit uh, on the dynamic programming, including this uh, popular article. Okay, see you next time.